Hey guys, it's Anetic. Guild Wars 2 is an absolutely massive game, and I don't just mean in file size. The game world has so much space in it, having 31 playable zones in the base game alone, and with the End of Dragons released, that space is now up to 62, if my math is correct. And that's not even counting the maps from the PvP game modes. Guild Wars 2 is full of easter eggs, neat NPC interactions, and overall, many little details that showcase just how much love the devs put into turning the world of Tyria into more than just an interface for game mechanics. Everything from the environment design, to the UI, the ambient dialogue in the open world all come together to create an artistic style that is so uniquely Guild Wars 2, many of those being easy to miss in a game as large as this one. That's why today, I want to go over 10 tiny details that you might have missed in Guild Wars 2. Before we begin, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy my content, hit the bell to be notified of my uploads as well. I'm almost to 1,000 subscribers on the channel, and I want to get there before the summer. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Now, without any further ado, let's get into it. Number 1. The mounts in Guild Wars 2 have constantly been praised for their design, turning them into things that feel more like unique creatures with their own ways of movement instead of what other MMOs do, turning them into glorified speed boosts pretty much. I've talked at length already on this channel about the mounts in this game, but one thing I've never pointed out before is this. Did you realize that each mount has its own skill bar design? If you look at your skill bar while on a mount, you realize that each one is painted to represent what that mount is. This is something that you may have subconsciously taken note of, only this year did it really click inside of my head that this was the case, and it's not something you'd expect to see coming from other MMOs. Number 2. Whenever you're fighting an enemy in an MMO, you can usually expect them to have some sort of mechanics to have to deal with. Whether that be an interruptible channel or an obvious AoE you have to avoid, it's pretty much a staple of combat in the genre. Some of those enemies may put unique debuffs on you that can't be removed through regular means like spells. In Guild Wars 2's Path of Fire expansion, you can encounter creatures known as Sand Eels. They typically have two mechanics to them, which is a knockdown attack and an attack that puts a debuff on you, causing you to bleed occasionally. You can see this debuff above your skill bar, but you can also see it on your person as well. You attach a little baby Sand Eel to you that has an actual model that sticks to your character until the debuff falls off, or you dodge roll to remove it. It's a neat little telegraph that can go unnoticed at times during the hectic moment of combat, though it's definitely a detail you can depreciate once you do notice it. Number 3. If you're a fan of playing Ranger, then you're probably familiar with the Warhorn as a weapon. It has two skills, one of which deals damage while the other provides boons for your allies while dazing your enemies. But did you know that the second skill has a secret third effect? If the Rangers use Call of the Wild at the same time, a ghostly lunar wolf will be summoned. This is a reference to a t-shirt with three wolves on it called the Three Wolf Moon, that entered meme culture back around 2009, where it was common to leave sarcastic reviews about it online. Number 4. If you've played the story quest of Guild Wars 2, you may have encountered moments where you have class-specific dialogue with NPCs based on what class you're playing. These kind of interactions don't only extend to the dialogue, however. In the Icebreed Saga episode, Jormag Rising, there is a mission called Behind Enemy Lines, where after going through a short stealth and sabotage section, you meet up with an ally that tells you the path forward is blocked by magical ice walls. For most classes, you can grab a flamethrower from a box in front of you that can be used to melt them, but if you're an engineer, you get dialogue about how you brought your own flamethrower that can be used to handle them. If you're an elementalist, you bring up how your fire magic can deal with the ice walls. This isn't just flavor text, your fire spells and flamethrower attacks will deal extra damage to the walls, and while this does not change how the course of the story goes in the long run, it gives the player a sense of their choice of class as some sort of meaning in the story. Number 5. The story of Guild Wars 2 takes place over 100 years after the events of Guild Wars 1. During the original game's lifespan, they released the Nightfall expansion, where you get to meet a character named Koss. He is a sun spear with a personality that many fans of the franchise love, and in Guild Wars 2 he makes a return, just as an undead. You can also meet his descendant, a man named Kossan, in the Path of Fire expansion of Guild Wars 2. If you help Kossan with an event in the Desolation, you unlock optional dialogue with Koss that mentions him when you meet the former sun spear in Living World Season 4. Really? Ah, oh, what a relief that is to hear. I never knew the fate of my beloved Milani or our children. The Jajaran line lives to fight another day. Thank you for that news. To know they went on to live their lives, have children, grandchildren. If I weren't so dead, it'd warm my heart. Number six. Elite specializations were first added to Guild Wars 2 in the first expansion. A new class was also added, the Revenant, which had its own elite specialization as well. The Herald uses the power of the Dragon Glint to support its allies and defeat its enemies, granting them access to the facet skill type. When you activate a facet, a song plays that you might recognize if you played Guild Wars 1. Take a listen.
This is the theme of the Crystal Oasis from Guild Wars 1. Number 7. This one is a little detail, but on the Elon Riverlands map, you find some branded crystals that are pulsing a damaging AoE once in a while right outside of Augury Rock. If you stand in this AoE and get hit, your character starts to cough because of the crystal accumulation getting into their lungs. They had to record a coughing sound effect for this, and I'm not quite sure if it is used anywhere else in the game, but if it is, please let me know in the comments down below. Number 8. Guild Wars 2 is an industry leader when it comes to its underwater maneuverability and combat. But one little detail about the water that goes unnoticed is when your character exits a body of water, your screen becomes covered in water droplets that appear in randomized shapes and sizes. The fact that they're randomized is what's easy to miss here, as one does not usually pay attention to those little moments. Number 9. It is not uncommon for a fantasy world to have languages that come along with it. You can see this in just about any genre that has a fictional race that doesn't exist, whether that be elves with elvish, orcs with orcish, or other more unique things. But what is not common is for these languages to be fully translatable into real world text. Guild Wars 2 has this with New Crichton, but luckily it's very easy to do. This is because New Crichton translates one to one with English characters. So if you ever see a sign in game with New Crichton letters on it, you can fully translate it into English. For a fun challenge, I recommend going to Divinity's Reach and going to over to the graveyard. There are a ton of fun things there to translate. Number 10. Guild Wars 2's wiki is perhaps one of the best when it comes to the MMORPG genre. Anything that exists in the game becomes chronicled on it, whether that be legendary weapon paths, event timers, lore, or anything else. The community keeps it up to date with anything they stumble across, and over the years, it's become one of the most helpful resources you can find when playing the game. You can even access it through the game itself by using the slash wiki command in chat, which opens your browser to the wiki page of whatever you put into chat for it. And the devs even put an easter egg into the game that commemorates it. If you head to the Durban Priory, you'll find an asura in the corner named Wiki, who is known for writing a guide to Tyria, which is obviously a reference to the wiki itself and all the people who have contributed to it over the years. With that, it's all for this video. I hope you enjoy, and leave a comment down below about any other tiny details that other people may have missed. Remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.